In the intricate tapestry of history, there are events that ask us to unravel their complexity, to seek answers amid uncertainty. Welcome to a deep dive into the SL-1 reactor disaster. Was it a grave mistake, an outcome of incompetence, or does a darker truth lie beneath the surface? In the middle of the 1950s, the US Army needed a new means of providing power and heat to their remote military installations. In this search, they wrote out their important criteria and reached out to the Argonne National Laboratory due to the links to the Manhattan Project. The Army laid out a long list of criteria, the most important amongst them being 1. All components able to be transported by cargo plane. 2. Use of standard components so Army personnel can construct a reactor safely. 3. Minimal on-site construction. 4. Simplicity and reliability. And 5. A 3-year fuel operating lifetime per core loading. The Argonne National Laboratory accepted the contract and began to design the reactor. By July 1957, they began construction at the Idaho National Laboratory, which they completed one year later in July 1958. Then only three months later, on July 11th, the reactor went critical. And again, by December, the reactor was officially handed over to the Army, so they could begin gaining operating experience and training. To understand the disaster, we must first meet the men behind it, John Burns, Richard McKinley, and Richard Legg. Ordinary men with extraordinary roles. They, like all other reactor operators for the Army at the time, arrived at SL-1 as trainees, after training at Fort Belvoir, Virginia for eight, eight months. McKinley and Burns were Army specialists, whereas Legg was an electrician. All three of them were young men, none of them over the age of 30. In fact, Burns, he was just 22. Unfortunately, these men were not exactly model technicians or members of the Army for that matter. The trio were known for engaging in strip clubs and alcohol in Idaho Falls when they were off duty. Burns was known to have a fiery temper and Lake was a prankster who had been caught setting off alarms in the facility on purpose to scare his colleagues multiple times, and yet he had been promoted over Burns. This led to the two forming a contentious relationship at work, even leading to the two having a drunken brawl at a party, adding to the tension. Leg had even taunted Burns and married man with a two-year-old son, accusing him of cheating on his wife with a local prostitute. This didn't exactly lead to a comfortable work environment. To really understand how SL-1 could go so wrong, you need to know how a nuclear reactor works in the first place. Nuclear physics is complicated, but nuclear reactors themselves aren't that complicated. First, reactors use fuel rods. These fuel rods are filled with radioactive material. They need to be organized in a certain pattern close together. This allows the heat naturally generated by the radioactive decay of the uranium within. To raise the temperature of the adjacent fuel rods, this leads to them releasing more and more energy, which then leads to them to heat up in a runaway effect. This alone is uncontrolled and dangerous, but you can control the reaction and the amount of energy released within a reactor with what's called a control rod. These are made of specific materials that can absorb the particles emitted by the fuel and limit the runaway reaction. By using these control rods carefully, you can control the amount of heat generated. The way a nuclear reactor creates power is by using this heat to boil water. The steam is then sent through a steam turbine to generate power. The problem with SO1's reactor design was that in order to try and limit the size of the reactor itself to follow the Army's guidelines, the designers had to limit the amount of control rods present within the reactor. For example, most modern day nuclear reactors contain around 150 to 200 control rods, whereas SL1 contained only 5, in a pattern similar to that of a 5 on a dice piece. This pattern created a problem of its own. The design meant that the middle control rod, rod 9, was incredibly powerful. So powerful, in fact, it was able to start and stop the reactor on its own. This was seen as incredibly unsafe due to the fact that there weren't multiple fail-safes in the event the rod malfunctioned or even got stuck. Of 
On January 3rd, 1961, the facility buzzed with activity as the day shift was relieved by Burns, McKinley and Legg. All three were completely unaware that their lives were about to be tragically cut short. The three men's instructions for the night were a standard routine. They were to prepare the reactor to be activated the following morning after its period of deactivation. In the previous few days for maintenance, one of these steps proved to be fatal. The reconnection of the control rods to their drive motors. At around 7pm, Burns received a phone call from his wife. The short conversation ended with her asking him for a divorce. Two hours later, the overworked and stressed Burns would be attempting to pull up the center control rod by four inches so that it could be reconnected to its drive motor. But he didn't. Burns yanked the rod and pulled it out 20 inches. This caused the reactor to go prompt critical and generate 20 gigawatts of power. 100 million times the rated amount. Within 4 milliseconds, the core exploded. Then at 9.01pm, an alarm started blaring at the fire stations nearby, indicating that something had gone horribly wrong at SL1. Within 10 minutes, they arrived at the reactor building and immediately their Geiger counter started going off. They waited for a security team to arrive and open the unguarded gate and called for a health physicist to oversee the rescue efforts. The firemen entered the building, 100 feet from the reactor itself. When they entered, they found the facility empty with no signs of fire. Once they took two steps inside the building, their Geiger counters revealed radiation in the environment. Because of this, the fire engine was ordered to wait outside of the area on standby and the firemen retreated back outside to get in touch with the contractors behind the reactor's construction in order to figure out if there were any men on staff. The contractor confirmed that three men were on shift that night, and so the assistant fire chief then re-entered the building into search for the men. As he approached the stairs leading up to the reactor room, he measured a reading of 25 Röntgens per hour on his Geiger counter, and withdrew once more to request more accurate measuring equipment, backup, and a better protective clothing. 20 minutes later, two health physicists arrived with better equipment, the fire chief got changed into protective clothing and re-entered the building with the health physicist in tow. They quickly attempted to reach the reactor room, but this time once they tried climbing the stairs leading up to the reactor room, their Geiger counters shot to 500 Röntgens per hour, and they both ran back out of the building. Understanding the risks, two SL1 personnel alongside a different health physicist volunteered to enter the building in order to locate the men still inside. They managed to locate two of them amongst the rubble and steam. It was Burns and McKinley. Burns was dead and McKinley was barely alive. They quickly went to retrieve more men to mount a rescue attempt for the man still alive. They placed him on a stretcher and quickly took him to an ambulance. McKinley died on the way to hospital at 11 p.m. In the meantime, a second four-man crew entered the reactor room in order to locate the third man, where they found Leg impaled to the ceiling by control rod 7. It had gone through his groin and pinned him to the ceiling through his shoulder. The aftermath left a haunting scene of destruction. The reactor's explosion was swift and less than a blink of an eye, leg and burns were killed. It is assumed that McKinley's injuries were so traumatic that it is very unlikely he was conscious at any point after the incident. His body was just barely hanging on. McKinley and Burns were taken to a chemical processing plant nearby to be autopsied. It would take nearly a week for the cleanup crew to recover legs. The crew responsible for the cleanup faced a morbid task of retrieving legs impaled corpse from the roof of the reactor building. This was made even harder due to the fact it was dangling above the mangled and exposed reactor core. Eventually, the cleanup crew were able to use long handled hooks to pull the leg down and catch him with a stretcher extended via a crane. Finally, nearly seven days later, the bodies of the three men were finally able to be reunited. The investigation was meticulous and the autopsies were brutal and complicated. The men were so heavily irradiated, the coroner had to stand 15 yards away and complete the autopsy as fast as possible, between 15 and 20 minutes. 
Lake was so heavily irradiated he was giving off 1,500 Ronkins an hour of radiation. Autopsying him would have been impossible unless the coroner first removed his head with a hacksaw connected to a long pole and placed it in a lead box. The autopsy reports were crucial in pinpointing the approximate location of each of the men at the time of the explosion. The whispers of a love triangle or a man grappling with marital difficulties spread widely and persist through books and online to this day. These rumours were a natural consequence of the prolonged investigation process. Yet, the official reports subtly manoeuvred to shift the blame. In an AEC film detailing the SL1 accidents, it stated, Direct cause of the accident clearly appears to have been manual withdrawal of the central control rod blade by one or more of the crew members considerably beyond the limits specified in maintenance procedure. However, there was insufficient evidence to establish the actual reason for such abnormal withdrawal. The deliberate exclusions and understatements of the significant design, operational and oversight issues with the SL-1 reactor exposed a strong undertone of evading responsibility for the tragedy. It took several days after the incident for the bodies of the three men to be correctly identified. Initially, there was a mistaken belief that the man suspended on the ceiling was the new McKinley, who was thought to have made a mistake. When it was later discovered that the crew supervisor was the one who was impaled, there was an unofficial assumption that Burns had intentionally pulled the central rod. Although the initial report after the accident based on the autopsy findings concluded incorrectly that legs had been lifted the control rod, I am of the opinion that intentionally vague statements were crafted to shift responsibility for the accident onto Burns, who raised the control rod. This maneuver seemed designed to protect both the contractor and the AEC. In my view, these young men were simply striving to tackle the extensive list of tasks assigned to them on that evening. Their limited seniority and lack of comprehensive awareness regarding safety problems likely prevented them from advocating for improvements at the facility. We conclude our expedition with a call to curiosity and to the acknowledgement that within historical events lies a web of untold stories. The SL-1 disaster remains an enigma shrouded in time, framed by human nature and etched into the history books forever. Thank you for embarking on this voyage with me. If you found the exploration thought-provoking, be sure to like and subscribe. As we untangle the mysteries that shape our world, remember the questions that intrigue us most often lead us to the depths of our own humanity. I hope to see you again soon. Until then, goodbye.